deep it. Mmm. With air, with air, with air. J supplies, live in the flesh, you know. We're saying people, them, you lot not outside, raw. We moved though. It's nice outside. No, 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 I, no. KG, no chance. It's not added as a Nike. No way. <laughs> hey. Hey, FMJ. Hey, don't worry, Josh, man. Josh, we're back, man. We're back soon. One more day left. One more day left. Hey, Alabi. It's all them sessions we've been doing in the morning, bro. I keep telling you, look. Back. Back. Hold on. I think it's in here. Let's go. What's good, Marlon? How are you? Yes, my bro. You okay? I'm good, man. I'm good. Yourself? Yeah, good, thank you. Very good. How's things? How's things at the moment? Yeah, good, bro. Just uh, back at work, trying to sort out a few things now, trying to ease it back in. It's been a mad time at this moment. Of course. Like, um, what have you been up to? You've been keeping fit? Yeah, trying to. Um, over the little bit of lockdown, doing my 5K runs. And yeah. my first one, my first one, I was like, Jesus, it's foreign territory. Because so I haven't been doing anything for the last two years. Just been working with my company um, yeah. and obviously the lockdown made me realise just to go out and have some runs and stuff and the first one I did I was, it was a wake up call yeah well, as, what, I, as I got what? sorry what was the time on the first one 31 5k run <laughs> yeah bro <laughs> madness madness but I got it down to 24 and then now this morning I did 23 so it's coming down it's coming down getting yeah. myself fit it feels good to be fair no, that's good, good. Yeah, just um, going to talk a bit about football and then a bit about where you're from. For the people that don't know you, Marlon, just tell them a bit about yourself and where you grew up and your background in football. Okay, um, I'm a Camden, Camden Town boy. I grew up in Hampstead Heath. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Haverstock Secondary School and then from there I went to Nottingham Forest where I was there since I was 14, learning my trade, signed professional forms, between 16 and 17. Then I made my debut for Nottingham Forest at 18. And then obviously went on to my few other clubs, West Ham, Aston Villa, Newcastle, and a few others, which decent clubs, to be fair. What was it like, what was it like you um, getting into football in Nottingham Forest at a young age? What was it like? Because probably back in your times, like, it's football's totally different now. So what was it like during your times? What was the managers and the coaches like? Was there strict... Yeah, very strict, very strict. It's old school methods, really. They're growing up from their time. Um, and literally, because I'm a coach now and see what they do, it's totally different to, to what I've gone through because it was like a sink or swim situation. When you're on that pitch, you've got to be reliable. Being a centre forward, when that ball comes up to you, it's got to stick. When you've got yeah. mans like Stuart Pearce and Steve Chettle pinging that ball into you, you've got to hold that ball because if you don't, they're going to let you know about it so it, it, it's it was totally different from from now until when I used to play massively what was it like what was it like moving like you said at a young age to Nottingham so bro what was it like moving at a young age to Nottingham Mate, my mum and dad couldn't wait for me to get out of London. <laughs> as soon as they found out, <laughs> as soon as they found out I was I was I was half decent at football and Nottingham Forest was interested in me, they was taking me up there every weekend whenever they could, because uh, it was just to get them out of London, get them out of the around the area. Um, it was just a nice thing for them to 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 look that my son's going to go and play for Nottingham Forest. Obviously, at the time, Nottingham Forest Academy was the place to be at. Mm. 
So obviously, yeah, you going up there at a young age. What was it? How, how long did it take you to settle in? Because you being a London boy, you being a London boy and moving. Yeah. What was it like for you? Was it like? It, it was it hard. Like? It was hard. It was hard. Very hard. Obviously, all I know is my mum and dad was quite strict. I weren't allowed out or round the ends or do anything. I had to like beg my dad to get out um, just yes. to go and play football, all them kind of things. But obviously, you realise when you're away from home how much you you miss your parents. Yeah, of course. Especially the food as well. So <laughs> the food is totally different. <laughs> Nothing better than home cooked food. But obviously, when out there, you get accustomed. It's just the transition that I had to go through day in, day out, training, getting working hard. It, it's the things you have to do to, to be a professional footballer. Would you say, would you say um, your parents being strict on you helped you in your career? Massively, bro. Massively. I, I thank them for it. At the time, you, you hate them. But then yeah. when you look back and you see when you have your own kids, you realise what they actually was trying to do and trying to achieve. So it, yeah. it made me the person I am today. Um, very respectful. I'll try and respect people as, as much as I can and get, get respect back. Uh, my dad taught me that. And manners don't cost a thing. And that's how he was. So, but obviously he couldn't, he couldn't do what he did to do now. And then now these days he'd be locked up. <laughs> but um, yeah, I do thank them for how they was with me. And it's made me the person I am today. How long was you at uh, Nottingham Forest before you moved on? Uh, well, I was at Forest for uh, eight, nine years. I was there. And then it got to a time, a time in my career where we, we got to the playoffs and we missed out on the playoffs. And me yeah. and David Johnson, we had a really, really good year. We scored about over 50 goals between us in the championship. Wow. And we just, we just missed out um, losing in the playoffs semi-finals. And then uh, I had West Ham coming for me that year. It was my last year on my contract. Um, couldn't really, when a club like West Ham or someone like that come in for you, you can't really turn them things down. So you played, like, you've been at, like, none of us for nine years. When you, when you heard... When you got the call that West Ham were in for you, like, what was the family's reaction? And like, was you excited, happy that you're going to the Premier League? Yeah, at first, it, obviously, it's just like talk. When you're in football, there's a lot of talk going around. But then when it, you actually go and your agent says, look, we're, we're going to have talks, then it starts to get serious. And then you have to talk to your parents and tell them what's happening. And obviously, they were excited because I'm coming back to London. So it, it, was, it was nice in that sense, but it, it's, it's exciting because you go into a Premier League club. Obviously, they got um, relegated to the Championship. And when Pard spoke to me, that was his main goal, is to get back to the Premier League. And the things he was saying, he was saying that I was his number one. Um, yeah. Like, I'm not getting any strikers in. Like, have faith in me and I will make you one of the best players at West Ham. Wow. So when you when you hear that, that's a lot of reassurance for you. I'm sure you must have felt like, you know, I'm ready, like, ready to go. Yeah, big time. Because they had players like Jermaine Defoe, Michael Carrick, and Don Hutchison, David James. These are the players that I was going to be with. So literally, like, couldn't think of anyone else better to go and further my career. Now, of course, you get there now. How are you feeling? Like you said, you've got players like Jermaine Defoe, just being amongst... Premier League players, like, was you thinking, wow, um, I'm a Premier League player now? Well, no, I didn't think I'm a Premier League player at the time because obviously I have to got to go and prove myself that I, I'm, I can be amongst these players. Um, but at the time, it is quite scary and daunting. Even for me as a, as a player playing for Forest, the players that I played with, obviously, it was my next level where I wanted to, to be in my career. And being in that dressing room was quite quite daunting but the lads made me welcome quite quickly because yeah. I, I knew a few of them I knew Jermaine um, quite well um, yeah. growing up so he, he made me welcome Michael Carrick was was amazing for me at that time as well when I joined he, he sort of looked, took me under his wing and looked after me um, which is amazing as a player like that coming to say like Marlon I, I, I got you don't worry and all the lads were, were fantastic to be fair Now talk, 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 talk to me about um your time at West Ham, because you become, like, you became one of the fans' favourite. Like, everyone loved you at West Ham. Talk to us about your time at West Ham. Uh, it, it, it's this question that I get asked quite a bit. It's hard to describe, because once you're in it, you would understand being a player, training with all the lads. Um, Pards did really well the, the four years that I was there. Um, the, the people that he recruited, the players and everything like that. And 
obviously playing up front with all the players that was there and Pard stuck to his word with me. So he literally yeah. said, like, you're going to be my number one. So I was playing up front with Teddy Sheringham, Bobby Zamora, Dean Ashton, Yossi Benayou, Carlos wow. Tevez. So, like, this is the, the time that I was there. And, and the, the dressing room just got bigger and bigger. We had, like, Anton Ferdinand, um, Nigel Ria Coca, Bobby Zamora. It, it did, the dressing room was just so so good that we had a feeling we understood where we all come from all the players were like grounded uh joby makanov who i've been speaking to the other day he, he he was in the dressing room and all these players that from around the area understood what it meant to be a professional footballer and that's why we did so well the first two years that i was there because the time i was there we had, we got to a final nearly every year yeah of course and i remember i remember one of the finals when you know he was the main man talk to us about that when you're thinking like, you've done it, you've won the FA Cup, and, you know, Stephen Gerrard just comes and, you know, takes it away from you. Look. I know, it was, it, was, it was madness, bro, it was madness, because we had, as players, we had no fear um, that yeah. year against anyone. All the top four, top five teams, we, we was excited to play them because they, they're coming to play us. We made, we made sure that they were scared of us, and obviously going into that final with that, with that attitude, we knew we was, we was going to win it. It was weird. But then obviously going, I think we sort of took our foot off the pedal because we went 2-0 up so quickly. We're like, fucking bloody hell, we're playing um, Liverpool in the final and we're 2-0 up in the Epic Cup final. So I think like our mentality after that, I thought we, we took our foot off the pedal, but we still maintained that sort of aggression that we had. Um, obviously they came back and then we fought back and then they came back and then obviously it went to penalties and penalties is always whoever's on the day, um, can put them, put them away. Yeah, cool. Would you say in football, that's a big thing, the mentality? Because we know, we know we watch football a lot of times. Like, you can be 3 now up, 2 now up, but if you're thinking, yeah. wow, it can suddenly change for you. And do you think you have to keep that mentality well, it's still nil-nil? Yeah, but massively. You have to keep that mentali mentality to say that, it's only nil nil, lads. Let's go again, knowing that you're two. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying obviously nil nil, but you still have to maintain that mentality to get you to the one nil or the two nil to to maintain that throughout the whole game. It's hard, but you have to do that because um, you can tell even the best teams like Liverpool they've maintained that last well this season is obviously starting back. They've maintained that all the way through um, that that mentality of a winning mentality. Once you have that, then it sort of takes care of itself, if you understand. No, no. No, it's... Like, I remember watching that game and, like, you scoring and um, it's like... I can't remember. You got injured. Was it, was it cramp or you got injured? Yeah, I broke my fifth metal tarsal. Wow. Yeah, it's hard to take, bro, because we're talking about it yeah. now. Like, it's crazy. Because I'm usually penalty taker as well. I usually take yeah. the first penalty. But I didn't take any penalties. So, we'll never know how the situation will would have changed after that after that after that final you must have like like everyone would feel you must have been devastated but did you think that you could go again get to another final with that squad yes and no but obviously players move on um yeah. obviously the next season and the way we lost as well because there's so many situations in that game where we could have won because obviously west ham fans would know about scaloni when the yeah. ball got thrown onto the pitch and he kicking the ball, not kicking the ball out of play or kicking it further. It's one of them moments that there were so many moments in that game that we could have won it. Um, it's, it's, it's just a hard one, really, in, in the dressing rooms, how we were just thinking, like, we were so close, but we did, we did give it our all. Like, you, you've been around, you've been around, and um, after, that, after that season, obviously you said you, you broke your metal tarsal. How long did it take you to get back? And what was that like mentally for you? Like, it was mentally. Yeah, after losing the final and then knowing that you've done that, how was that? How, how was that to take? Yeah, it was hard to take. Very hard, obviously, because like you, you can't be with the lads. You're literally injured on the injury table um, to try and see out the season. Um, and obviously, everyone's still down, and it's hard to to get picked up. Obviously, to tr try and go again after you've just so close to winning the FA Cup final and obviously being in that stage then you've got to try and pick yourself up and then go again then you've got pre-season 
everyone's still thinking about that moment because obviously West Ham fans, it's one of them, it's a massive occasion to get to something like that and to lose how you did. It's one of them things you need to start afresh and pick them up and start the season really well. No, no, I see it. Knowing that you've played like a lot of games, you played a lot of games in the Premier League with West Ham and you played a lot of league games. Has there ever been a period, like a dark period in your career where um, things wasn't going quite right for you? And it was yeah, difficult? Bro. Yeah. Uh, I, would, I would say it, it, my first time at West Ham in the Premier League, um, I think I went 10, 10 games without scoring. And, and as a striker in the Premier League, that's, that's hard. Yeah. That's tough on the striker because it, everyone knows when you're playing week in, week out in, the, in, the, in them leagues, you've got to be scoring goals and you've got the, they're looking to you to score. And if you're not scoring, they're wondering why you're, being honest, still playing, if you get what I mean, if you're not scoring them goals. So it sort of grated on me a bit because I was doing everything right, getting in the positions. Um, Teddy was telling me in training, the time to worry is when you're not getting in the positions and stuff like that. So I, I was doing all that right, but it still weren't going in. And so I had a, like, sat down one evening with Teddy in the change rooms. And I just, like, had a little chat with him, like, Teddy, how'd you do it if you've not been scoring? He says, it's mile. You just have to keep going. And just take a breather and take calm. When that chance come, take a second and a mind and just just think like you're going to score. So yeah. just take that breather. And, to, and it's mad because my first goal was Teddy. He put me in. <laughs> and then I, and I went on to score a hat-trick against Aston Villa that game. So like I composed myself when I got put through by Teddy. And I was like in my head, like I'm going to take my time now. And I just literally slotted it in. And then after that, Every time I went through, I scored. See, when you're going through them kind of um, periods, Marlon, I just wanted to ask, do you go through it yourself or do you look for someone, like a mentor, to talk to you, like someone who on the mental side can help you with what you're going through? Or is it you just go through it yourself and you have to get out of it yourself? Yeah, it's a good question. Again, my time when I was playing, we had to go through it ourselves. Um, yeah. It was sort of like a sink or swim situation. But obviously nowadays everyone's getting that help, which is is very well needed because the game's changing so rapidly. Um, but I had good players around me to talk to, so um, it was quite easy in that sense because I like I obviously I had Teddy Sheridan and Bobby Zamora. If I had a, had a problem, I'd go to Nigel. Nigel was our captain at the time, and he, even at a young age, he was quite wise in what he way he was and how he's thinking. To be, to be fair, anyone in that dressing room, if I had a problem, I could go and talk to. But there weren't specifically someone there to go and talk to someone else because it, it's hard as a player because you, you, when you're in that environment, you don't really want to show that you've got a problem, which, yeah. which is yeah, which is hard. But, but obviously nowadays people are coming out, which is very good to, to talk about the problem so they can perform on the pitch because you yeah. would never know if someone's got a problem on the pitch. Um, they will just hide it and deal with the situation because of the environment that they're in. Like you said, you, you had um, you had great players around you, and I, I was um, like lucky enough to play with um, Teddy Sheringham when he went to Colchester. And like yeah. you said, Dave and um, just reminded me that when I started playing, he was even telling me when I was a kid, like you know what, just keep going, you're doing well, and that. And you look you look at players like that, you're thinking he don't need to come and tell me that because you know he's a big no. established player. But it was... Yeah, stuff, big like, time. Stuff. Yeah. Sorry, bro. Keep fading that. Now, to come and tell you, like, you know, keep going, don't stop. And, like, he's a big player. And I'm thinking, wow, like, he didn't need to come and say that, but he's telling me, like, do this when you're playing, do that. And I, I reckon that helped me as well along my career. So that, that's... Yeah, good, I, was like. just about, I was just about to ask you that. How, how did you feel through your career in that situation when you was in a dark situation? How did you overcome it? With me, obviously we are with different teams. Yeah. With me, it was the same situation, actually. Like, we, I had to deal with it myself. We didn't have people that would help you on the mental side. And at first, I struggled a bit. I didn't get when um, managers used to make you run. And mm. that. I struggled. With young, and I was thinking, why is he being like this to me? Or why is he making me do this? Why is he making me do that? But, you know, like again, like you said, you speak to some of the pros. And they said, you know, don't let people break you. Just keep mm. going, running. But I remember at the time I was so young that I said this many times. I just stopped coming into training. 
Yeah. Because I was young, I didn't know how to take it. I didn't know what was happening. I just stopped coming into training and I was getting letters saying that I'm going to get fined, you know, this amount of wages and that. And um, I remember I, I spoke to my mum and that. And lucky enough, like, the manager that was there at the time got sacked and, you know, I came back and the players, like, welcomed me back in and that saying, you know what, when you go through something like that again, just stick yeah. at it. Will break you because um, you sh you're showing signs of weakness. So, uh, like as I'm playing now, I'm still playing. And um, when I see the young ones now, who are like you know at the cities and the Arsenal's and all these things, I just try to show them the right way, like and show them that like, don't do this when you're going through a tough situation. Do it this way because I know what I know what it's like, and I've know I've been through it. So I'm just trying to help yeah. the youngest that are. You know. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, like I said, I did. I just had all the players. Yeah. No, it's decent to be fair. I, I had older players throughout my whole career because I my generation of like um Mark Crosley, Stuart Pierce, Kevin Campbell, Brian Roy, Pierre Van Hoydonk, Steve Stone, Ian Woe, that's the dressing room that I was in at eighteen. And to yeah. be fair, they, they were old school methods, but they still looked after me and still yeah. guide me in how things to do. And literally like it's totally different from it is now because they like Chris Bart Williams, he's telling me if I look at, just look at my body language because yeah. I'm looking to whip that ball around the corner. If you're not looking, you'll, you'll, yeah. you, will, you will struggle because you've got to get hold of that ball. Yeah. I'm looking to show someone else that's going that way, but I'm really, I'm cutting it this way. That's so I'm going to cu cut it to you. So you better yeah. get hold of it. And I'm like, bloody hell, I've got, you're, yeah. like, you're, on your, you're on your toes. Like that ball's coming to me. Even if you're not thinking the ball's coming to me, I had to make sure like, I'm waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. But it's it's crazy. It's crazy, like, how you, how the generation are working now, training, the coaching methods and stuff that I have to go through at Nottingham Forest is... I can't speak highly of them at the moment, because like, the, they, when they took me in the last three three years I've been there now, and it's it's been fantastic with how they deal and how they do with the kids and stuff and bring them through. I wish I had that in my time. <laughs> And like you said, now now that you've, you've you've had all the experience and knowledge, it's nice of you to pass it down to the younger players who you're you know working with and stuff like that. So it's always good. Yeah, I try to. I try to as best I can. Really, it's hard because the kids nowadays think they know it all. <laughs> so with social media and everything like that, so because they get handed everything to them on the plate. So where I come from, I had to work for it. If you get what I mean, like when I was coming up from London and going to Nottingham, the academy, I'm making sure I stay here. That mentality mm. of I'm, I'm getting a contract. I want to be the best player. So it's, yeah. I'm, not saying, I'm not saying the kids today haven't got that. They have, but they just have to have that extra edge to want to wanna be a professional footballer. No, of course. And you're right about that. Like, um, everyone wants to be a player. No one really thinks that they need to work that extra hard, if you know what I mean. Like, people, mm. you can have... If you don't work hard, you know how it goes, Marlon. Like, it, it don't Big mean time, nothing. Bro. It's crazy because I, I do a podcast, me and uh, Colton Cole, um, yep. and we get quite a few ex pros on it. And we've just been listening to Sean White Phillips, Jermaine Defoe, just on um, how they've been, like you, what you've been doing, going, growing up. And when I listen to them, I'm like thinking, wow, God, I, I think I did well, but I don't think I, I could have do more. I could do more, even more so than I think I could have done because I, I, I've had a very good career, me personally. I've enjoyed it and I've had some fantastic times. But then when I'm listening to them, I'm thinking, Jesus, like these guys are serious when I'm talking to him and how he, how he's like football minded, practicing, shooting, he stayed behind, he made sure he's finishing um, recoveries and everything like that. And the way they were talking, it was inspiring me and I'm, I'm retired. <laughs> so it's quite crazy. I was, I was going to ask you, like, I was going to touch up on that. If you was to look back, obviously, you know, you had to spell, spell out a villa and all these. Stuff. If you was to look back now, what would you have changed? Or what would you have tried to do differently? Yeah, good or, question. I, 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 I had a good career. But you personally, what do you think you could have done a little different? Yeah. Um, uh, me and Colton was talking about this the other day. I think... Like, as a pro, you get to a level um, yeah. and then you get not, complac not com uh, complacent, you just get um, comfortable is the word. 
Yeah. So yeah. you're going week in, week out. You're comfortable week in, week out. Obviously, you have your like elite players, like uh, all the, the Ronaldo's, Messi's that are like relentless, like winners, relentless, relentless. And but you should have that as a pro. Um, but I think I just got comfortable in my surroundings and when I was doing, I was, I was doing well, but I could have done yeah. better. Could have kept mm. on doing better. Keep working hard. Um, in shooting, I used to always stay behind shooting, but then but I used to shoot, and then if I missed the target, just go back to the end. But oh, like, okay. I was speaking to I was speaking to Jermaine. Jermaine say he would shoot, and he would follow the ball up, and then there's a, there's a rebound. He would score, even like in shooting practice. And he says like even when other people were taking shots, like yeah. he was queuing up. He'll be looking to do the rebound. So the lad will shoot, keeper save it. He'll be sprinting to get the rebound. Just that little, you know, that little edge that you wanna just, you wanna be the best every time. Like, and I think little things like that. I just think I've got a little bit complacent, not in a bad way, but I'm just trying to give you an answer of that I could have done more. If you could, you can always do more. Definitely can always do more. Do you think? Do you think you had the chance to play for England? Yeah, I did. I, I got the call, but um, yeah. I don't know what happened. There was a bit, a bit of politics involved in it because they took Theo Wilcock instead of me, which he didn't play because I was, I think I was a second top English goal scorer yeah, that, uh, that um, season. And was that, was that um, the World Cup situation? Yeah, I was, I was yeah. in the squad, but um, they chose Theo Wilcock over me. So, but. At the end of the day, you can't really argue with the decision. At the end of the day, you just have to respect it. But he didn't. He didn't even play or come off the bench or anything like that. Would you think? Would you think? Like this is just me asking. Do you think if he would have went to that World Cup, um, another move would have come off the back of that, or you would have been in a better position? I would say definitely been in a better position. Because um, that that label that you'll get as an England player, even if you're in the squad or anything like that, that surrounding um, being around that would it would change a whole different ball game. I wanted to say, like you said, you're retired now. We we all miss it. Even what's happening right now, we, we miss football. How bad do you miss playing football? Like, um, how bad do you miss the change room, the travelling, the staying over overnights, and all these things? <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't actually miss playing. I don't miss playing. Um, cause someone, my, else my said, business... someone else said huh? they don't miss. Someone else said that the other day they don't miss playing. I think it was Justin no. Hyatt that said. They don't, they don't yeah. Do that. They don't... No, I don't miss playing. You know, the only thing I miss is the the dressing room, the dressing room yeah. banter, and the and the training. I don't miss the playing. I miss the lads. Obviously, your routine, day in day out, going. That's the only thing I miss. I don't miss really miss. Um, playing because I've been so um, busy now with my business um, it, it's just it just took my mind off doing that but I, I'm still in football with my, my, my company and um, being an ambassador for West Ham because I'm still going to games every weekend watching them and supporting them so it's, it, I'm still in it but I'm not actually in it so it's nice to see all the lads and stuff No, of course, of course and I just wanted to go back on what we we'll touched up on before when we you go for a job. As a player, when you when you go for a job, but obviously you said you had players like you know Teddy Sheringham talking to you, Bobby Zomora. When you when you're reading stuff on the newspaper and stuff now, saying oh look, yeah. you, all this, how does it make you feel as a player? Do you do, is it like oh fuck sake, here we go again, or I'm gonna prove this newspapers and whoever's chatting a load of you know wrong. Yeah, I was, I was just about to say that it, it can. Either way, it depends on the person, how they deal with it. Some yeah. players take it to heart and it does affect them playing because when you go on that pitch, you're concentrating on what other people think. Yeah. And then other people use it as a, as a bonus, really, going on the pitch and showing people what, they, what they're actually saying. Like saying, yeah, you, are you joking? You talk about me like that and I've just scored in the top corner. Um, yeah. But it, it is hard. I've seen that happen. It's happened to us, to be fair, at West Ham. Um, we didn't have a really good season that year. We didn't start well, and the, they 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 turned on us. Um, but we had a good group, so the the change room dealt with it well. We looked after each other when everyone was needed, 
Um, obviously, going back to that situation where talking helps massively, um, yeah. but it, it did affect us a bit. Um, but we didn't let it. We came through it. And to be fair, we, we won on the last game at Old Trafford at Man United. Carlos Tevez, Carlos Tevez mm-hmm. scored and we stayed in, the, stayed in the Premier League. How important, like, like you said, how important is it to have, when you're going through them kind of situations as a group, to have like a good group and have a good captain where, you know, it's us against them kind of thing, stick together. We don't care about what the outside people are thinking, it's us in here. How, how important is it? It, me personally, in my opinion, it, it's massive. It's massive to have that in your... You, if you've got that in your dressing room and you've got that in the training, that reflects on the pitch. So you, you can tell the teams that are doing well in any division, their, 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 their dressing room and the training and how they are as, as, as a team, it reflects how they play. That, that's, that's my opinion. Because um, I've been in them situations where my, our, our dressing room has been unbelievable and we've, we've performed when we need to perform. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to touch up on, Marlon, yeah? When, like, when you was playing football, there was times, obviously, you have a little, you know, argument or kind of, you know, yeah. some sort of with the managers and that. What do you think about youngsters? Obviously, I'm not, I'm not, youngsters who are on a lot of money or, you know, wonder kids having, you know, arguments with their managers like on the pitch while they're getting subbed and that what do you think about that because back in back in your days i'm sure you couldn't have on the pitch Mate, you couldn't do that i wouldn't that? even think about it that that's where it comes in the respect factor i'm a very respectful guy um yeah. when the respect's due or earn your respect and if someone does that to a manager even if he's right or wrong there's times in a situation, in a game situation, you can't be doing that because you're just showing the manager such disrespectful, even if he's, even you think you're, you've done something and you're getting, and you don't agree with it, there's a time and a place to do that. And if any young player is doing that today, then they're going to lead their self onto a career of hardship because they're going to get their self labelled of a problem, of a problem person that in that situation because you need to be reliable. Managers need players to be reliable. And if you're doing that, he can't rely on you if he needs to make a decision, not any not because you're playing bad or anything like that. He's just he got to deal with a lot of players on that pitch. And if he if you're one of them people that he thinks I need to put a defender on and I need to take you off, not any reason, that's his thought process. You have to deal with that thought process and take it on and be part of the team. Um, but any young players that's thinking that way inclined, try not to because it just it just doesn't go good against you going on in your career. Uh, of course, because I was watching something, but doesn't it bring some sort of, you know, it makes it kind of, I can't explain it. What's the word I'm looking for? For example, we're just saying big players like Mbappe and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'm just saying, if he shows his manager disrespect in that, and then the manager drops him, He's gonna. The manager's gonna get stick from you know the fans and probably the board upstairs saying what you're doing. But... Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's showing, it's showing. It depends on the manager. Everyone's different in their personalities. But it's showing. Sometimes managers use it. In my experience, to use it like I'm the boss. Um, yeah. You, you listen to me. If I need you to do something, you're gonna have to do it. It's for the team. I'm not doing it just to to wind you up or get on your nerves. But obviously top players don't, even the top players don't like get taken off. But yeah. there's, there's a, there's a matter of respect because I bet Messi and Ronaldo, they always, their facials, when they're getting taken off, when they don't want to get taken off, they still show that they want to play. They want to stay on the pitch. That's the sort of um, emotions and, and, and you, that you want to show to people. I can understand that. But when you're taking it to another level, then Obviously, you're showing the manager disrespect. Okay, no, I understand. I take it there. You play, with, you play with a lot of great players, like you named in your West Ham squad, and um, and Nottingham Forest and yeah. Villa. If you was to to end this, if you was to give your best eleven from goalkeeper m- to mad bro, I couldn't. I, I, I've tried to do it so many times, <laughs> I just couldn't. I, um, <laughs> I I've tried to do it like. There's so many players that I I think are like decent, but I just couldn't. You 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 can't name an eleven like just from like I, I'm not, a, lot, a lot of people are gonna miss out, but yeah, a lot of people 11. are gonna miss out. 
So hard, bro. So hard. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll name a few. Like, there's Mark Crosley from my time growing up. His left yeah. foot was a one as a keeper. Then you got Brad Friedel, who I was. Then you got Shackle Hislop at West Ham, who I played with. Then them three keepers, this Dave Besson, who I played with, was unreal. Um, then you're going for the defence, Colin Cooper, Steve Chettle, uh, Stuart Pearce, Des Walker. Like, that, that, that's even, that's the old school lot. Des Little. Um, then you go into West Ham, Anton Ferdinand, James Collins, Paul Koncheski, uh Danny Gabaldon. This, this, this list just goes on. Martin Larson, Olaf Melberg, Bloody hell, then up in Villa in Newcastle. You've got Colacine at Newcastle, um, Tails and Taylor. Then you've got Stillian Petchoff, Gareth Barry. Wow. Then you've got Ashley Young, James Milner, Stuart Downing, Yossi Benayou, Matty Everton. Wow. Nigel <laughs> Rea Coca, Hayden Mullins, who I think are top players. Javier Mascarana. Mm. I, just, I, don't, I, don't, I just can go on and on and on. And and even stri- stri- can't even name strikers. Can't even, I don't even go there. Can't even <laughs> name them. God, there's so many. Brian Roy, an absolute legend. Pierre Van Hoydonk, um, Andy Carroll, Bobby Zamora, Teddy Sheringham, Dean Ashton, Buddy Gabby Obongahor, wow. John Carew, Emil Heskey. Wow. What? What? How'd you choose from them, Carlos Tevez? Wow! 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 And yeah, they're all smash. decent players. I like, even though even though you can like pick them out, someone's gonna miss out. But I can't pick from them because they're all good in their own way. No, no, you play with uh, it's some lot madness. Of... It's like Charlie Adams. He's a baller as well. Oh yeah, Charlie Adams. Him. DJ Campbell, Cams. Wow. That's a lot of great players. No That's Ranger. Which, no, he, no, yeah. He was on your thing. I was listening to him the other day. Yeah. He, he could have been an absolute baller, but yet again, he, he has to, you have to make decisions in your life. And, he, and I think he chose the latter, then sticking to what he is really good at. He could have been an absolute baller, to be fair. But he just couldn't get his head his head right in what he wanted to do. Yeah, that's that's when you need the um the good people around you. Yeah, you do, bro. Like, you do. I was talking to him, you know. He's he's doing good now. Now I just want him to push on kick on now. Yeah, yeah good. This football career is not long. This football career is not long, you know. Within certain people are lucky to play even till thirty six, thirty seven. But really, you no, know, thirty three or you know, some people even 30, if you know what I mean, Marlon. Yeah, no, it's still time. Even if, even if he just shows what he can do and just yeah. get his head down and, and work out for the last how many years that he wants to do it for, he's still got the ability. That will never go away. It's just his d- determination and if he wants to achieve what he wants to achieve. Oh, cool. This guy is an absolute baller. <laughs> but but it gets, his, I, his head. He knows that. But, you know, you, like you said... Yeah, but if you know that, you have to make a decision. Like, mm. it's, it's, it's life-changing. He could have changed yeah. his family's life. No yeah. matter what's going on behind the scenes, he literally can change his family's life if he wanted to, just getting his head down and concentrating on them and then getting rid of whatever is distance, distancing him from being a professional, a proper professional footballer and being disciplined. Mm. No, I've talked true. to him so many times and mm-hmm. you, you look at him and you like there's so many players I look at and you think wow like what you could what you can go on to do but at the end of the day it's up to that individual person what they want to achieve that's crazy man Marlon thank you so much for this chat man thank bro so any time man no you're welcome thank you it's, it's good to uh, good to chat and good to speak to you this won't be the last one as well We'll have plenty more. Yes, bro. Plenty more. We have plenty more. Yes, bro. Bless. Thank you. Thank you, Marlon. Take care. You're welcome, bro. Cheers. Cheers.